I'd like to show you uh, some of the improvements, uh, and some of them are quite significant, in the way that we actually deal with 3D geometry and material information in general and tessellation. So um, in, in, uh, to start uh, with, uh, I'm just going to start with this uh, basic 3D text. Um, and, uh, and the first thing that I'd like to point out is if I double click on, uh, on my text object, you will find a new button here that, uh, that is called multi-material. And if I activate it, something in the schematic happens. You see that uh, three new nodes are connect get connected to the geometry, and those are called object groups. And you'll notice that they are actually called front, extrusion, and back. And what this allows you to do is to actually control different uh, properties of the front side, the back side of the text, and the extrusion of the text. We can do this on text objects because, obviously, we know that typically their topology is always uh, comprised of the same things, you know, front, back face and the extrusion. On, on regular geometries that you would have imported, well, uh, Flame doesn't allow you to create the object groups. However, one thing that is really interesting is that if you import a geometry or an FBX geometry, for example, that has object groups specified, uh, that were specified in the application, they will actually get preserved uh, through the FBX import. Um, so in the context of 3D text and GMask, uh, both have share the same sort of uh, assumptions on the topology. And so the minute that you extrude uh, um, uh, a 3D text or a GMask, you will actually get, you'll be able to actually uh, activate multi-material and get a separate control over the front, the back, and the extrusion face. So let's see what you can do with this. Um, uh, the first thing that, I'd, uh, that, that you can do is, first of all, use a new material node that's here in the node bin. And you will notice that when I drag this, it gets automatically connected to, uh, to the uh, currently selected object group. And what this will allow me to do is essentially control the, the material information that is typically nested inside of the geometry surface information. And, and you will recognize here the specular, the ambient, diffuse, transparency, and shininess controls. And if I connect a material node to an object group, any information that I put inside the material node will override the geometry information that is currently stored. Uh, the material node can be applied not only to a 3D text, it can actually be applied to anything that has a surface property, and that would include an image uh, as well. So let's see what happens if I switch back to my perspective and I start changing the diffuse color. You will notice that this... Uh, that the result is that uh, uh, the color only changes on the front face. And because this is a node in the schematic, I can go ahead and actually decide to parent also another object group. And at this point, what this will do is automatically copy the same material information onto the back face. So if I rotate my 3D text, you will notice that both the front face and the back face now are blue. And I, if I go ahead and select uh, the extrude, uh, uh, object group and add another material, I can go ahead and uh, this time change the color of the extrusion, thereby providing me with a lot more control over how I actually want to segment my, my text object. Um, material objects uh, are something that you can also texture further. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, um, any object group that was specified in a 3D application will be preserved through the import. Um, we've actually even changed the way that, um, uh, for example, a th uh, 3ds Max uh, geometry uh, would be uh, imported inside of the application. So if I go ahead and, uh, uh, let's say, import... Uh, uh, I import a, a 3ds Max, any 3ds Max geometry, you will notice that uh, uh, it appears with a material node and it also appears with an explicit diffuse. So this is an important thing to understand. The material can actually be textured and, and because we now uh, explicitly expose the texture, it means that you can replace it with anything that would be in your media list. So if I go into the media and select apply, you will notice that my cube here gets automatically textured with um, whatever texture I decided to apply to it. And it obviously preserves the UVs and the material information that are specified inside of the, inside of the geometry. Again, this will apply to FBX and 3DS uh, 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 geometries. So this is something that you uh, can use to your advantage. Um, to go back to uh, this example here, I'm just going to uh, unhide the geometry 
and again highlight the fact that uh, material uh, material can actually be textured. Uh, so let me just reset this so that it's uh, back to something that's uh, not necessarily colored. Uh, and let me actually show you how you can actually uh, even texture it with a substance texture. So if I go back to my node bin, to my maps, and I go ahead and uh, uh, go to the uh, substance texture, I can go ahead and select any texture that I see fit. And you will notice that it will get automatically parented to the material node. Uh, the shader also will get automatically connected to the geometry. If I switch back to the uh, perspective, I see that I just have a, a little problem, which is my uh, relief mapping that is switched on. If I switch it off, there you go. You see my, uh, uh, my texture gets applied only on uh, only gets applied on the uh, front and back face of, uh, of my object. And the other thing that I'd like to show you is that um, uh, we've also considerably changed the way that uh, the tessellation uh, is applied to 3D, uh, 3D uh, text objects and G-mask extruded objects. And to, uh, uh, you will notice that uh, now in the uh, 3D text and the G-mask uh, uh, object, you actually have a, a new, uh, new submenu, which is called tessellation. And so to see the effect of this, I'm just going to switch to uh, wireframe so that you see. So this is typically the type of tessellation that uh, was, uh, was used uh, in, uh, in previous versions. So for compatibility reasons, it's still there. Uh, but if you go to the tessellation submenu, you'll see that by default, it's still using the, uh, uh, the GLU uh, uh, um, tessellation algorithm. But you now have access to uh, two different uh, other techniques. And uh, those are actually taken from uh, from uh, Softimage, so we we work closely with them to to incorporate some of the tessellation algorithms that they uh, that they uh, implemented uh, also to to do text tessellation, and so you will notice that you can actually get a lot more pleasing a much more pleasing tessellation within your objects. Uh, this is using the Deloney. Um, uh, uh, algorithm and where you can actually control explicitly the number of maximum vertices and the maximum area of each polygon. And as you see, you get a much more pleasing, if you change also the uh, minimum angle, you will, you will be able to actually control much better the way that polygons get spread across the surface. And I can control the maximum area, so I can actually get to a result that is a lot smoother. Uh, that's a lot smoother uh, on both the front, the back face, and of course the extrusion. This can also be accumulated with subdivision, uh, which provides with a lot of a lot more flexibility and control. The other the other option is medial axis, which has another set of parameters. Essentially, it's different algorithms to achieve the same thing, and you should experiment with whatever provides you the best results, depending on what it is that you want to do. And of course, one of the biggest advantage of having this is that uh, displacement mapping for example, on 3D geometry is going to be a lot better now than it ever was before. So to give you an example here, I'm just let me just hide this geometry. And uh, I have this uh, G-mask here uh, that I import and it's currently being displaced. Um, and uh, you will notice that the quality of the displacement map that I get now on my geometry is significantly higher than it ever was before in previous, uh, in previous uh, versions. Uh, so here in this context, what you have is I have this geometry that is, you, is, is being tessellated with the Deloney algorithm, and I further subdivided it uh, so that I would, uh, I would also be able to have like more control on, on the sides. So here I have a subdivision to resolution 10, and you will notice that the result is actually a lot more pleasing uh, than it was before. So here this is a geometry that is being currently lit both by the IBL, and it also has shininess, a shininess attribute that uh, is set to 100 and a diffuse color to sort of like a bluish color. So you will see that, uh, again, this gives a lot more pleasing results, much more pleasing results with displacement, making actually displacement really a viable option on, um, on 3D geometry. So something to look out for. Um, so um, moving on. 
uh, I'd like to show you also some other improvements that were, uh, that were added uh, in, in the way that we uh, also deal with FBX geometry. So one thing also that is uh, uh, pretty cool in the 2012 release is that uh, uh, the FBX import in 2012 using the 2012 SDK, it's very important to note that, it's with the 2012 SDK, actually Flame now supports geometry caching or point caching, which is a way of actually baking animation of vertices inside of the FBX. Um, and this allows you to actually preserve. So here I have this, uh, this model here. So it's a low poly model that has animation applied to it. And as you see, it has this animation cycle that, uh, that was imported into Flame. And the animation is actually preserved inside of Flame. And this is through uh, geometry caching or point caching, depending on how you want to call it. So uh, the interesting thing is, as you bring this into Flame, you can still relight the geometry. So in this context here, you see I'm, I'm actually uh, relighting it uh, uh, so that it can cast shadow over a floor. And the floor is actually a substance texture. Uh, and I'm using here an IBL uh, uh, sort of as a, as a background image. Uh, but the point is that uh, even though you have animation uh, applied to it, you can still pretty much here. I've just added an axis on top of my of my FBX that I grouped in uh, instead of a group because it can be sometimes a complex hierarchy that I don't want to see. Um, and here I can still freely move it inside of 3D space. I can scale it. I can do pretty much, you know, what I would expect to be able to do with the geometry, and actually uh, uh, even relight it with a uh, uh, with a light inside of my 3D space. And what you see at this point is that I've actually deactivated. Uh, as I move the light around, I actually have some adaptive degradation settings that are kicking in uh, in the node setup. I can actually, when I activate. Um, uh, adaptive degradation. Here, I'm actually telling the software to deactivate the shadows uh, the minute that I interact with anything. So if I move my camera around, or if I move a light around, the shadows actually are set to do not display. I can also have extra options like actually switch to the minimum possible resolution of my shadow maps in order to accelerate the feedback. So adaptive degradation actually is something that you, uh, you may want to consider. Uh, when uh, uh, to compensate for some sluggishness when you're doing when you're doing uh, stuff with uh, with light. So here you see I'm set now to uh, actually switching to minimum resolution of the shadows, and you can see I can actually relight uh, my my geometry, and it's actually going it's being applied on the fly into my scene, and again my animation is preserved. So that's geometry cache. And of course, anything that uh, supports geometry cache, and that would include cloth simulation, physical simulations, all sorts of things, can now be preserved and imported inside of, um, inside of Flame uh, without having to deal, and even a character animation for that matter, without having to deal with any of the complexity of, uh, you know, of a rig or inverse kinematics. You don't have to worry about this. It's only the animation that is preserved. And of course, you can project anything on that geometry inside of action. So that's pretty cool. Um, and another thing that is being supported inside of, uh, inside of Action is uh, the importing via FBX of anything that uh, has substance uh, textures applied to them. So here what you see is actually a cube that was uh, done inside of Maya with different substance textures applied to them. And uh, what you, so it's a slightly different format of substance textures as uh, they don't actually recognize the uh, flame shader, so they may render slightly differently when you import them via FBX from Maya. But the point is that you recognize that you're recognizing the schematic here, that this is how my geometry actually appears. You will notice that it has been sliced into object groups with material nodes, and I actually have the substance information that is there. Um, and so that's uh, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting, and I can uh, actually on the fly decide to then change the parameters of. Uh, of my substance texture. So if I want to go ahead and actually uh, change the uh, 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 change the uh, the parameters of the substance, I can. Uh, so substance, everything that is common in Flame, Maya, and 3ds Max will be preserved when you import them inside of Flame. So that's kind of cool, also.